Um, I'm Harry Sowers. I'm a junior here in the CS program. Um, and until coronavirus happened, uh, I ran the Python at UCF club and we're hoping to start back up in this fall as soon as we can, uh, fingers crossed, safely return to something in person. Um, so without further ado, I figure we'll uh, just jump into the content I have for you. Um, I cannot share my screen here though. Uh, Christopher, would you be able to help me out with that? Oh, yes, let me fix that. Sorry, uh, one second. There, you should be able to now. All right, perfect, it looks like it. All right, so can everyone, uh, everyone see the screen here? Yep. All right, wonderful. So I have this video prepared, um, you know, really talking about what is Python and uh, why you should learn it. Um, I'm a big Python fan, so here we go. In this video, I'm going to answer the top three questions my students ask me about Python. What is Python? What you can do with it? And why is it so popular? In other words, what does it do that other programming languages don't? Python is the world's fastest growing and most popular programming language, not just amongst software engineers, but also amongst mathematicians, data analysts, scientists, accountants, network engineers, and even kids, because it's a very beginner-friendly programming language. So people from different disciplines use Python for a variety of different tasks, such as data analysis and visualization, artificial intelligence and machine learning, automation. In fact, this is one of the big uses of Python amongst people who are not software developers. If you constantly have to do boring, repetitive tasks, such as copying files and folders around, renaming them, uploading them to a server, you can easily write a Python script to automate all that and save you time. And that's just one example. If you continuously have to work with Excel spreadsheets, PDFs, CSV files, download websites and parse them, you can automate all that stuff with Python. So you don't have to be a software developer to use Python. You could be an accountant, a mathematician, or a scientist and use Python to make your life easier. You can also use Python to build web, mobile, and desktop applications, as well as software testing or even hacking. So Python is a multi-purpose language. Now, if you have some programming experience, you may say, but Mosh, we can do all this stuff with other programming languages. So what's the big deal about Python? Here are a few reasons. With Python, you can solve complex problems in less time with fewer lines of code. Here's an example. Let's say we want to extract the first three letters of the text, hello world. This is the code we have to write in C Sharp. This is how we do it in JavaScript. And here's how we do it in Python. See how short and clean the language is? And that's just the beginning. Python makes a lot of trivial things really easy with a simple yet powerful syntax. Here are a few other reasons why Python is so popular. It's a high level language, so you don't have to worry about complex tasks such as memory management like you do in C++. It's cross-platform, which means you can build and run Python applications on Windows, Mac, and Linux. It has a huge community, so whenever you get stuck, there is someone out there to help. It has a large ecosystem of libraries, frameworks, and tools, which means whatever you want to do, it is likely that someone else has done it before. Because Python has been around for over 20 years. So in a nutshell, Python is a multi-purpose language with a simple, clean, and beginner-friendly syntax. All of that means Python is awesome. Technically, everything you do with Python, you can do with other programming languages, but Python's simplicity and elegance has made it grow way more than other programming languages. That's why it's the number one language employers are looking for. So whether you are a programmer or an absolute beginner, learning Python opens up lots of job opportunities to you. In fact, the average Python developer earns a whopping $116,000 a year. If you found this video helpful, please support my hard work by So not a bad, uh, not a bad average salary there, I think. Uh, so Python is really key um, I, in a 21st century software world. And it's just growing more and more and certainly outpacing other languages like Java, C Sharp, C++ and industry. Uh, as is automation. 
So a lot of things that used to be done by hand, especially working with Excel sheets, downloading files, um, data analysis, and so on, is all getting automated. And most of that's through Python. If you know how to write Python, uh, even, even if you want to go into software engineering, it, it can be a huge competitive advantage over everyone else in the field who may be coming in, you know, knowing literally only Java or uh, just some front end stuff. Also, outside of software, there's tons and tons of jobs where, you know, even just knowing a little bit of Python to be able to script with it would be very beneficial for you. Just in your day-to-day -day life, you can use Python to do, uh, stop doing boring stuff. So a year or so ago, I, uh, I actually wrote a program to do my calculus homework for me, uh, work included in everything. Um, you can also do it for uh, you know, various types of data analysis, working with Excel, web scraping. And the great thing about it is you have a lot of code that's already been built out there. Um, whether through open source projects or libraries that are directly accessible through, um, through your Python package manager. So one example of something you can do is uh, I wrote a, a bot for Instagram, which runs on an Android emulator on a desktop. Um, in Python, I used uh, other tools called Selenium um, and Appium and the Android SDK. So. I'll play this on two times speed because you'll pretty much get the gist of it that way. Oh, sorry about that. So this is starting up the, uh, the Android emulator. We run it, we plug in some, uh, some login information here. Um, as well as some other arguments to work with. It then opens up the Instagram app and logs in. This is fully automated through Python. And then we go into the homepage, search up the hashtag. And the bot will then go through and like posts in that hashtag. Um, so anyone who's run an Instagram account it's, uh, you'll know that it's pretty important to engage with people that share your interests uh, for that account. So sometimes that, uh, a lot of times that involves a lot of manual work. Sometimes it can only be done manually, like actually engaging with followers. But if you just throw out a couple of likes here and there on the right hashtags, um, it can pretty quickly drive up engagement. So disclaimer, I don't know if this one would still work as a, uh, you can imagine Instagram is not thrilled about people who do this, but because it's running on an Android emulator, it looks pretty native um, and it's hard to track down. Another one is Unischeduler. Um, this was written by uh, my friend and colleague uh, Stanislav. Um, he was a member of Python at UCF and he wrote it mostly in Python as well as uh, HTML, JS, CSS for the front end. And this will actually take your schedule. I believe it works for most Florida universities even, um, but you just paste it in here and it populates your calendar with your class times, um, classroom locations, and even includes holidays and days off. So I use this every year. Um, he also pulled in the Google Calendar API so that way it could integrate fully. Yes, Dima, AutoGrader is awesome as well. Um, I heard he's pushing out some new updates to it for senior design actually. But um, yeah, so I use this thing every semester. It's, uh, it's, it's definitely a game changer here. And right here, scheduler.oatmeal.cc is the link in case anyone wants to uh, bookmark that for the summer. So some of the perks of Python uh, is that it has a very gentle learning curve. Um, unlike a lot of other programming languages, uh, C comes to mind, you can, uh, you can pick it up much, much faster than anything else. Um, if you've never programmed before, I would guess it would take you around 180 hours. Um, so really just a few weeks to get totally fluent in it. If you can already program in something else, um, it, it took me a week. Um, definitely a very full-time week, but uh, pretty fast. It's uh, platform independent, runs on Windows, Linux, and Mac. Uh, a little bit easier on Linux and Mac than Windows, but uh, It'll still run regardless. It's 
despite its ease of use and low barriers to entry, it's very much a serious programming language that uh, software engineers everywhere use. It's really, really simple in terms of the syntax. And in fact, it was designed with simplicity and beauty of the code first. Um, and you can write hello world in one line, which is, I, I, I think, a pretty, pretty compelling value proposition there. Um, yeah, Robert, I totally agree with you. Um, there are some aspects of the design that aren't totally perfect in my eyes as well. But uh, it just feels very, very clean. Syntax is easy to remember, and best of all, you can, it doesn't force you to learn object-oriented programming if you're not familiar with that yet, but you still can. So just drop it in the chat or unmute yourself. What's the number one boring thing about your job or schoolwork or anything else that you could automate or that you would automate if you could? Calculus homework, maybe? <laughs> Zoom recording links, that's a good one. My brother said he actually wrote a Python bot to uh, join his Zoom meetings in the morning, so it looked like he was attending, even though he was sleeping in. Yeah, so Python, I mean, basically everything except for maybe essay writing, you could definitely do. Um, and you could do it with very, very quickly with a low time to market. So lots of companies and people use Python. Um, Netflix is entirely built on Python. Um, Instagram runs on Django web servers, which is a popular web development framework for Python. And uh, Boston Dynamics even, which makes the spot robot actually controls these via Python. course, that's a uh, pretty cool use of Python there, um, I think. Python actually has uh, a series of development standards, um, style guides, and sort of just general development philosophy. Um, one of them, one of my favorites, is called the Zen of Python, which is the uh, PEP 20 is what it's called. Um, some key takeaways is that Python is invented so that it's readable first and foremost before any other use. Um, even if that occasionally means sacrificing performance or uh, brevity of code. And really, one thing I like to say is if you can speak English, you can at least read Python and you're probably about halfway to writing it, um, just because it's so close to spoken word. Um, it does run as an interpreted language, um, unlike a compiled one such as Java or C, it runs instead like JavaScript um, where it's looked at, the interpreter looks at it line by line. Um, so this does result in some slightly worse performance as uh, we're having some discussion in the chat that relative to a language like C or C++, Python is a bit slower. Um, for the most part, this doesn't always matter, but sometimes, uh, you know, if you're working with a very low latency application, sometimes that can be troublesome. One, one key... Uh, key workaround is that it's usually cheaper to give your developers a good development experience and just throw money at the hardware um, because hardware comes cheap and it lasts at least, you know, a good while, but good developers don't. Um, 
Whereas if you opted to write something in C or C++, you end up having a relatively poor development experience um, and sometimes a much lower time to market, even if it does run faster or smaller. Um, that's not to say there aren't plenty of applications to use lower level languages, uh, but that for a lot of, you know, most, most applications that we are gonna be working on, uh, Python would be a great tool for it. It can also handle both scripting and full applications, um, even full web servers, which not many languages are able to do. So uh, I guess just to demonstrate how fast we can uh, develop in Python, um, we are going to implement what's called a REST API. And we're gonna do some web scraping while we're at it as well. Um, so you all have computers with you, I imagine. So please follow along. Um, we're not gonna install anything. So we'll just go to REPL.IT right here. Um, I'm sure you've used it for some classes. So I've already created mine. Um, you can log in with Google or create an account very fast. You just make a Python one, name it whatever you want. And if you wanna follow along on mine live, this is the link. So API stands for Application Programming Interface. It's a way for different computer applications to exchange data and talk to each other. Um, REST is a formatting standard for APIs over the web. Um, and we can see this example. It's, uh, it defines a specific way that you format a URL. So if I'm looking for a user with a username of Harry under the app directory, I would format a, a URL like app slash user slash Harry as opposed to app function get user and name equals Harry as parameters. Um, these two often end up doing the same thing but the REST standard is generally seen as much cleaner and uh, easier to document and is very widely used in industry. So uh, APIs are really, really valuable tools to have. Um, I've run a few on my own as well and developed some in internships. Um, at, in Python at UCF, some of our members have built web apps and uh, even an Alexa skill for the UCF parking garages, which certainly used to be more valuable when uh, we were going to campus all that often. Um, so today we're going to scrape data down from the UCF Recreation and Wellness Center to see, uh, to see when the gym is available for a reservation for us. Um, so we'll code this up and then serve it through an API. Um, the advantages of doing this through an API instead of, uh, you know, instead of just manually running a script, printing it out into a text file or emailing you, is that the data is easy to consume by other computer programs, um, and it's designed to be. It also gives you a dedicated computing resource. So if we were to run this on a remote server, we could just have it up in the cloud running 24 hours a day. Um, so I can have my own uh, Alexa skill. It keeps turning on, I have one. And uh, okay. sound. Alexa, stop. <laughs> so uh, I, I won't use that word. I'll call it the, uh, the echo dot, I guess. Um, but yeah, you can, you can pipe it into a mobile app, into the Echo Dot. Um, you could even write your own script to check when it's available and automatically, uh, automatically register a slot for you if you wanted, which I don't know how the UCF RWC would feel about that. So get permission before you do that, but um, just one possible use case. Then you also have what's called loosely coupled architecture when you use an, AB, an API in your software. Um, so that means you have multiple parts, all of which uh, don't heavily depend on each other. So if one part breaks, it doesn't bring down the whole system. And it, that also makes it easier to push out new improvements to it. So open up your REPL um, and we're going to write some method stubs. Um, this is a useful way to begin your development as it breaks down your program into the digestible parts and stops you from writing a uh, hundred line main method. So I'm actually going to split this up into two windows here. Can everyone still see that? Cool. 
so we'll uh, we'll just get typing. Um, and make sure to include comments so you can understand what the code does. So a bit of explanation. This is how you define a method in Python. I believe that it's very important to have uh, descriptive method names. So when you have a method called scrape gym data, it's uh, pretty clear what it does. No one, no one can really screw that up. Yes, also called a function. And then the pass keyword just indicates that uh, there is no code to execute here and to move along in the program's execution. Um, so it's nice if you are writing just a method stub, because if we get rid of it, the Python interpreter will look here, we get a red line, and it'll think that there's some code here, even though there's not. So we don't want that. Um, yeah, next up we'll do formatted data. And this one is going to be called git gym availability info, which is going to um, extract the actual data from the raw HTML um, that we get through here. And then, of course, we need a main method. So we'll just make that def main. Python does not actually execute the main method uh, by default, and instead, It'll either execute the code at the leftmost indent, or it'll look for if name equals main right here, and then it'll run the code inside. Um, so that's nice when you're writing a library or something of that sort, where you don't want the code to be executed every time. You only want that if you are actually running it directly, as opposed to importing it in another program. And then within this, we will just run our main method. So this part seems a little, just a little bit redundant. Um, I would almost prefer Python to look for a main method directly, but uh, I didn't develop it, so. So libraries, as I mentioned earlier, are uh, collections of code that someone else has already written. Typically they're open source and uh, they allow us to use. Um, as you may know, a lot of computer applications are very interconnected and the world is actually totally dependent on open source code. Um, and this article here on course, which I will copy the link over into the chat, um, a large part, portion of the internet was broken because uh, some anonymous developer uh, deleted a bit of code from his GitHub repo and a lot of stuff depended on it. And uh, when you have these cascading dependencies, you remove you know, the thing at the very bottom, you can break the whole internet without realizing it. So side note of that is contribute to open source projects if you can, it's a great way to build experience um, and to, you know, I guess, give back a little bit. So we do need to import a few libraries to build our app. They're all open source. So if you're curious, you can actually look up their source code. Um, we import them really by asking Python to import them very, uh, very simply. So uh, beautiful soup or BS4 will we use for web scraping. Flask is a popular HTTP server. Requests um, allows you to make HTTP requests to websites as if you were a browser. And then date time handles dates and time. So we will just import these. Any questions about this so far? And the idea behind importing really all of these libraries is it saves us hundreds of hours of development time to be able to uh, extract data from websites, 
serve up our own website, um, make HTTP requests and handle dates and times. So next we're going to set up our API. Uh, Mike, there's a way to do it. Unfortunately, uh, I have no clue. Uh, I'll try and do that here because I, I always hate it. Code intelligence, is that it? Yeah, what? I don't want any code intelligence. We'll turn that off. That would be unfortunate. It does not appear that it did for me. Um, so yeah, we'll just, we'll get to the actual web scraping um, and, you know, parsing data a little bit later because we have to first be able to have an application to serve it up through. Um, so we'll set it up. Basically what we're going to do is configure Flask um, and then add a basic homepage for the unofficial UCF gym API. And then we're going to run this app, run the API application um, within our main method. So we'll start, we will set up our Flask app. Um, don't worry too much about all of the parameters here. These are uh, pretty, just, pretty much just run of the mill and you copy any Flask example, it'll probably say this. As you get into more advanced stuff with, uh, with Flask or Django development, these will become a little bit more relevant to you, but for the time being, um, we are all good as they are. The text is auto wrapping. Um, yeah, not a whole ton I can do about that. Although if it's in parentheses, I don't think it matters. You could put a breakpoint in there and sometimes you, uh, sometimes you should if it goes on way too long, but hopefully your IDE will yell at you. Um, REPL will not, but I prefer to write my Python in, uh, I, I'm a big fan of PyCharm. I also use VS Code from time to time. They're both great. Um, really just a matter of personal preference. Yes, Python does handle indents differently um, and you have to be careful about that. So we set up our Flask app. We will now make our first, just above our main method, we'll make our homepage endpoint. So we'll say, we're gonna tell Flask that when someone goes to the root endpoint, making a get request, then we're going to display the contents of this method. And we'll say, welcome to the unofficial UCF Jim API. And then within our main method, we're going to tell, um, we're going to tell the app to start up. And it's going to be run on port 5000. Um, you can put whatever port you want. 5000 is the default value for a Flask API. Um, no, the inside method right here you can name it whatever you want. Um, I wouldn't even call it convention. That's just what I named it. Uh, this line here is the key one. So that, that's when you go to just the home page. it will serve up whatever is in this method. It doesn't have to be called root. And then we're going, this is, now this one is important. Um, we have to make sure that anyone on the internet can access it is we're going to set it to accept all incoming connections is what this value means. No, Will, it is, uh, it is not an override. It is actually what's called a decorator. Um, 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure we have too many overrides in Python. Uh, there's a way to do it, but you don't run into them that often. This is really just saying that the below method um, applies to this. So I think we're uh, pretty much all set on this one. Um, unless you all need a couple more minutes to copy some stuff down, but uh, let me know or I'm gonna move on. This is where it starts to get fun. We're going to add our first real API endpoint. That's not the home page. Um, and this is going to let whoever accesses this API um, get a, the gym availability for any given date. Um, we have to be a little careful with our formatting. And in fact, this is actually wrong. Um, the code's going to yell at us when it just gives us the uh, 225. It's going to want 0225. Yes, um, you want green squiggles in your imports. That means it is not used yet. Although I uh, hope Flask should be used at this point, at least some of it. JSONify and abort should not be, but Flask should be. So uh, yeah, below our homepage, um, we're going to add a, um, a method for the git gym available, or actually not below homepage. We already wrote this, sorry about that. This method, we're going to add a decorator um, and point it towards the endpoint of slash date and then a given date value. If you remember, the REST API formatting, we'll be able to plug in any date value here we want. And then within, uh, within these, these little characters, does anyone remember what they're called? I genuinely don't remember. Uh, but within this, it, it says treat this as a string and treat this as a variable. Yeah, carrots or sideways carrots, I guess. I always thought carrots was, uh, was like this, but I don't know. Angle brackets, we'll run with that. That sounds right. Um, yeah, and then we're going, with just within this, we're going to um, return some dummy data, but we are going to JSONify it. And JSONify converts the data on the inside into JSON or JavaScript object notation, which is a format to represent basically any, any object, any data in a way that computers can easily consume um, and use on the web. So now we have this. And uh, we'll actually give our REPL a run now. Oh, there we go. Oh, I must have broken something. Ah, of course. Okay, so I forgot my curly braces here because this is meant to be a dictionary. Um, a dictionary you can think of like a hash map if you're familiar with that or an array where instead of an index you it's it's you access the things inside by a string or other key. Um, so in this context placeholder would be the key and true would be the value. Exactly yes. Um, you could be yeah like a JavaScript object. So REPL's hand handling some of our installations. Um, this is something I really love about REPL is that it uh, takes care of all the dependencies for you. Oh no. I screwed something up. Uh, it should be date to value. Oh, um, I know why. Because we need to have date value as 
a parameter in git gym availability info. So we have to add that from the previous code. So your method header should look like this in the chat. So I think I messed this up. We're actually just going to delete this static since I don't think we need it. Um, and then here we go. We actually have that. And I'll just open this in a new tab so we can, uh, we can look at it more easily. And we can now see we're actually getting our homepage. Yes, normally you would need a package manager, Robert, to manage your dependencies. And that would be PIP, P-I-P. Um, it'll typically come with whatever, whenever you set up your Python environment, but uh, I figured I didn't want to spend all of tonight troubleshooting Python environment setup, and this is what REPL is really perfect for. So we can see we actually have this, and we'll even go to uh, slash date slash hello, because it'll take uh, anything as a date value, not necessarily a date. So let's say we go with two... 19, 2021, we have an actual date here. Um, so I use Firefox and it nicely formats the JSON. It might look like something like this to you. But um, notice that whatever we put in as our date value, it's going to spit it out back to us. So is that making sense for everyone? Any issues so far? I'll take that as a no, cool. Oh, when you run your REPL, it'll, it'll pop up here on the top. And then you go here to open in a new tab and just click that. Does that make sense? Yeah, no problem. Now if I can close that one. Yeah, I always like to just run it in a new tab because I, I feel like it starts to clog up the window, especially if I am uh, working with two windows on my monitor. So now we get to do uh, the actual fun stuff now that we've taken care of all of our API setup. Um, so web scraping is a way of pulling out data from a website, usually uh, from HTML. Um, you ask the website for its HTML and then you pull it into your Python program. And then Beautiful Soup will allow you to extract the important stuff from it. Um, nothing happened. Try running it again. Do you have your main method set up correctly if that doesn't work? Yeah, sometimes REPL, you just have to run it twice. Um, I imagine it's got something to do with how they set things up on their back end. And uh, Natalie, if you, if, if, you, if you can't figure it out in a little bit and are comfortable sharing your screen, um, we'd be more than happy to help you debug. Oh, okay, I must, I, I, uh, I must have missed that on whether or not Python was a typed language. No, it is not strongly typed, um, which is something you need to be very careful about. If you're expecting a value of one sort, um, for example, if, I, uh, if I'm expecting a number because I'm going to multiply it by five and instead I get a string, Python will just multiply the string by five and you'll get string, 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 string. Um, but yeah, as Dima said, you can still type them. There's a number of ways to go about doing that. But uh, it's important to validate user input because being weakly typed is, is something that's, or untyped, uh, one of the two is something that makes Python really nice um, and easy to use. It also means that you can break stuff without realizing you broke it. So 
So it takes, a, it takes a little bit of extra vigilance if you're doing anything uh, particularly important. Um, so now we're just going to write our scrape gym data method. I know this code is going to be a pain, so I will uh, exit our presentation and I'll just copy in the URL because I have this really already taken care of. Um, you might have some new line issues with this. I don't know exactly how that, that's going to work, but there you have it. And then here we are. So again, apologies for anything that looks like a line break. Um, this is all one line, so you can just copy and paste that. And yeah, the string multiply is actually really nice. Um, should you ever need 100 days in a row? Definitely have used it more than once. Next up, we're going to fetch HTML like a browser. And we're going to use the requests library to do that. So we'll say new variable HTML is requests.get URL dot content. And this is literally just asking the request library to get this website and then return back to us its HTML content. Um, but then we have, we're going to feed it into beautiful soup, which is our web scraping library. Um, and we're going to use the HTML parser tool, which is built in. So then we'll say soup equals beautiful soup. So we're actually creating an instance of a beautiful soup object from this HTML that we fetched here. Next up, we're going to find our, uh, the main content of the site that we're interested in. And in order to do that, you really need to play around with inspect element for a bit. So I'll just cut and paste this in here and show you what that process looks like, if it'll load on me. So we see, you know, we, we have some slots available at the gym coming up. Uh, if anyone wants to go, you got 10 minutes. We'll inspect the element and we notice, okay, we have a body. Um, you know, we have all the typical HTML stuff. We have our uh, div ID main and so on, but there is one, there is a section tag. If I can find it, or you can just take my word for it and we'll move on. Um, but yeah, you really just need to find the right HTML tags once and hopefully no one changes their site on you. So we'll say, okay, main section, soup.find section. Fortunately, Python is much better at finding HTML tags than I am. Next up, we're going to pick out all, your URL is undefined, huh? Do you have that exact code or, um, Maybe it's on a different indent level. This is all indented only once. Yeah, this is all one single line of code. So if we, if we maximize the window um, or not, I guess Ruffle doesn't wanna to behave today, but yeah, that's just one long line of code. This is yeah, if you can copy and paste that, um, it'll all be, and then indented by one level within your method, of course. 
then that should work hopefully. Okay, as long as it works, that's usually the case. You don't, uh, you don't always know what you did, but if the code runs, it runs. Cool, glad to hear that. Um, yeah, so next we need to pick out all of our possible time slots at the gym that um, available or not, we wanna know what they are. So we'll start that out by saying, well, time slots are going to be found within our main section and then we're, we want to find all of them. So we're going to use the find all method to do that. Looking back onto the website, we know that this is basically the data we wanna get, but for every single one of these little boxes. So going down, we notice that, uh, well, that's too far down, but we see this. Um, we see a whole bunch of these divs that apply to each possible box. So we're going to, uh, we just want to find everything that matches a div with that class. And we do that through uh, this code here, which I will again, copy and paste, because that's a whole bunch of HTML that you all don't need to be typing out yourselves, at least for now. You're gonna have to one day, but tonight is not that day. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I do, I do have it on public link sharing. Yeah, and I'll, I mean, I'm going to leave these up. So if you ever feel curious, feel free to come back and reference it again. Hey, Harry, is it okay if we upload it to our club's uh, GitHub repo, the slides? Yeah, by all means. Okay, thank you. Of course. Now I need to copy and paste this. And we will just get rid of that. And now it's going to be picking out our time slots for us. So this is actually going to have the data in HTML of every single one of these little, little boxes that hold the information that we want to get. Yeah, next up, we, uh, we need to actually extract some of the important stuff from it. Um, so rather than just the raw HTML boxes, we want to get, uh, we want to get the date that it's available, um, the time that it's available, and how many reservations we could still make. Um, so we'll start out. Uh, this code is going to have some formatting issues, so I apologize for that, but you all should be able to figure it out. It's just some indents. We're going to create an empty dictionary called availability. And then we're going to say for T in time slots. So we're just going to iterate over every time slot within our time slots array. Then we'll say, okay, our date string is going to copy that over again. Um, or actually, no, I won't. We're going to say time slot dot find HTML label tag with a class that matches program schedule card header because uh, that is the tag for our date string here. If you notice right here, we have label class program schedule card header. And then this, the content of it is what we care about. Friday, February 19th, 2021. And then we'll say, okay, give me the text of it. And then we're going to just go around and replace new lines, tabs, and whatever R is. Because those will really mess us up when we're trying to um, read in the data as an actual date, as opposed to a string with a bunch of white space.
stick another replace on there. There might be a better way to do this, but this is how we're running it for now. And this will just strip out all of the blank white space that will stop us from being able to process the date. Yeah, regex would probably be the best way to do it. Um, I figure now is probably not the time to introduce regex, but uh, yes. Um, next, we want to get our time string. So we know not just what date the gym is available, but also the time. So we'll say time string equals time slot dot find all. And we're going to have the small tag. Um, we're going to go to the first small tag that it finds, um, ask for its text, and then strip the surrounding white space, which is what the strip method does. But only the surrounding white space, any white space in the middle, it will leave, um, which is why we have to do a replace on this instead of just a strip. And then next, we will actually get its availability as well. We'll say slot availability equals time slot dot find all small. So if you'll notice it actually, they use the same tag, but then we want the second one in there. So index one, and we just want the text on that since it'll, uh, it'll give us fairly clean data. And this will allow us to actually pull out the meaningful information from the website. Is everyone still following so far? Cool. Now this formatting is going to be where it gets to be a little bit painful, but this is gonna be really key to uh, getting it into something that we can actually use. So first off, we're going to format our date string. And we'll say, okay, formatted date equals date time dot strp time or stir p time, which uh, is a method that allows you to import a date into the, into the date time class um, from a string. And then you just supply it with a pattern for that date. Um, and you can find this, you can find the documentation for this online regarding what exactly percent a means, which is a uh, day of the week and so on. But this is gonna vary for really any, any type of date that you're working with. So in this case, it says Friday, February 19th, 2021. There's so many different ways to uh, represent a date on a computer. Um, so fortunately the date time library allows us to be very flexible. So after importing it into the date time object, we're going to then spit it back out into a string, but in a nice usable format. So this will just give us month, date, year, separated by dashes, um, as opposed to Friday, February 19th, 2021. So painless enough here, just uh, need to Google a lot of documentation whenever you do this. Um, that's another tip I have is never ever be afraid to Google. Um, you know, the, I, I know senior engineers with decades or two of experience that still Google like everything, especially stuff like this. That's just so, you know, it's, it's small and unimportant and uh, very, very specific. Um, Kai, that's a great question. Um, Start off, try and just Google the problems you have as specifically as possible. So if I wanted to figure out, figure this out, I would, I would ask Google something like, and I did, um, how to import a, a date string with the day of the week into the date time library in Python. And you'd probably get a decent answer. Um, a lot of that is just learning to ask the right questions, which I think the best way to do it is through, really through trial and error. Yeah, Python date parsing will get you into the more general, um, 
more general documentation. Or you could search up, uh, you know, Python date time library documentation or examples. Yeah, so then we're also going to format our time string. And where this is just pretty simple. This is just really cleaning it up um, because our time string is going to include, um, it's also going to give us some spot availability and some other stuff in the HTML that we don't want. So we'll say, okay, our time string is equal to time string dot split. We're going to divide it on the backslash R character and then take the first one um, of the two, because this is going to split it up into two strings. And our, our time availability is going to be on the left one. And then next up, we have to actually process how many spots are available based upon this phrase, which is uh, fairly easy. But because when there's no spots available, if I can find, yeah, right here, if you go looking for a number or you go looking for this phrase, um, it's just, it's just going to break your program. So we're going to process slot availability. So we'll say, okay, if our slot availability, which we got right here, is equal to no spots available. Then we'll say spots available is equal to zero. Else, it can't be zero, so we have to figure out what it's going to be. Um, and in order to make it usable in a computer program, we're actually going to cast that to an integer. So we'll say spots available equals int slot availability dot split, which is going to split up this string on the first space. And then we're going to take the first part of that, which is going to be the number of spots available that we actually care about here. Then after that, we'll say, okay, well, because we are given a, uh, a formatted date here, we'll say that if that date does not exist within any of the spots available, um, then we will just uh, leave that as an empty array. Um, so this is important because if we try to add in a slot of availability into a date um, and that date has not been created yet in our, uh, in our availability dictionary, it's going to throw an error and break our program. So we don't want that. Um, so next up, now that we've made sure that it, this, this piece of our dictionary will exist, then we will add in a, an available gym slot. Oh, forgot an underscore there. And we're going to append it to it as an array as opposed to uh, wiping it out as a single value. So this will allow us to have multiple time slots available in one single date. And then we'll just create our own little dictionary here with our key of time set to our time string. And then available set to our spots available. And then after that, we will de-indent once, which again, sorry about the Google slides. We'll just say return availability. And this is going to be the, all of the availability from this entire website, regardless of the date.
So I know uh, string formatting can be a little bit, a little bit heady and a little bit painful. Um, and, you know, working with raw data, iterating over arrays, it's all just stuff that you have to do to get through the, all the data crunching. Um, but once you do it, it's great. And yes, Robert, it is way more painful to do it in C than in Python. Leah, I, I, I make that typo as well. Um, it's the, that's the struggle with using long words and uh, complete phrases and variable names is you're a lot more prone to making typos. But if I just did A, B, C, D, E for everything, wouldn't make any typos, but I also couldn't read my code. So this will actually give us a nice, pretty output once we finish um, with something like this. We're going to ask it for a date, and it'll give us the available time slots. But we, uh, we first have to figure out how to make this data available to our API users. So uh, when a request is made to the API with a given date, it'll still just spit this out just a placeholder stuff because we have yet to address that. Um, but when someone asks it for the availability on a given date, we want to actually send it to gym availability in JSON format. So really, because we have all this data and it's formatted nicely, it is not yet in JSON, but it will be. Um, but it does include dates that the user didn't ask for. So we need to narrow that down. So within our get gym availability info method, we will say gym data equals scrape gym data. And this will just pull down everything from that website. We'll then say output is equal to gym data with a key of whatever date value the user asks for. And then we will JSONify it and return it. So this will give us a subset of the full of the full data um, of just the data that matches that date. And then this will spit it out as JSON for our application to actually be able to use. So then we will uh, restart the program and refresh the website. Hopefully I didn't break it. Oh, I broke it. So it happens all the time. I forgot a second argument in this, um, and I'll copy paste that code down for you. So in this replace, the replace method requires two arguments. Fortunately, the Python debugger is nice about telling you that even if it does give you a whole bunch of kind of garbled text. But right here, it'll tell you what went wrong and it'll tell you the line of code that it went wrong on, which is very nice to have. So we'll just, uh, we'll replace that. And yeah, it's error messages are way better than most. Not always perfect, but better than most. So then we will try that again. But that does mean our code at least starts up, which is cool. Not again. All right. So now, huh. Date time has not, huh. I don't think that's right. So now I'm just going to Google this. Unless anyone uh, has a guess before Google tells me. Oh, I'm probably, uh, I'm probably asking it. Yeah, I am importing date time instead of, I need to say, from date time, import date time. You're not getting what answer, Benjamin? What error are you getting or are you getting one? Maybe you, uh, I screwed up the imports. Maybe you didn't. Well, if you're not getting an error, is your, uh, can you see the, uh, the output?
Yeah. So our app route for, uh, yeah, REPL can take a while. For this one? Yeah, no problem. REPL sometimes does take a little bit. Um, you know, you get what you pay for. I am just glad they're giving it to me. So I still broke something. Ah, I forgot the year. Okay. So everyone makes mistakes in their code. In this one, where is that? Yeah, when we are processing the date, I forgot to ask it to uh, include the year. So this is going to be Thursday, February 18th, and then 2021 is what that's going to be. This is the fixed code. And we did it. We actually have a working output now. Or if you're on another browser, this is probably what it'll look like. And this is going to be all of the availability slots for the garage, uh, not sorry, for the gym um, on for tomorrow, February 19th, which if you know, this is the date that we plugged in. This does include slots with no availability. So uh, if you ever were to consume this in another program, you'd want to handle that. But this means that you can actually have a computer program or a mobile app or anything like that or a Echo Dot skill that talks to this API on a server somewhere whenever you need it and spits out the data in a format you can actually do it. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know exactly how to handle that. Um, I'll pause my share and you can try. <laughs> 